Thanks for listening to DIY for Business. It's Russ and Greg with you. Greg, how's it going? It's going awesome. I see you are have a little different background than I'm <laughs> used to. What's going on? There? Exactly. Well, so I am. I'm at the uh, the office in uh, Petaluma, mm -hmm. California. Um, this is the like a, a couple of episodes ago we chatted about me doing this like trial at this uh, at this office space, co working space. Um, loving it. So oh, we're getting a whole office here, and right now I'm in the conference room. So it's pretty cool. Um, it's, what is it? What is it that you love about it? There's a couple of things. I mean, first of all, it's just like the whole getting out, right? Like leaving the house and, you know, going through that process of, you know, I, I take the train up here. So it's like a 15 minute ride or something like that. And that's nice. The little walk before I get in here. Great. Uh, of course, the coffee machine. Fantastic. But what I like is like that, that sense of like just being a part of something with other people. You More know? community. Like, Exactly. Exactly. Okay. I mean, there's, there's other people here. We're all, we're all working. We're all talking. We're all, you know, like waving to each other, whatever they're doing, like a little thing this evening. Uh, they're doing an art show actually for, for people here that are artists that right. are showing their work. So it's like all of those little things that just, you sort of miss out on when you're working from home, you know, right. like the, that just really just smiling at somebody <laughs> you know, or waving to somebody like you don't get that. I mean, I wave to my cats. They never wave back. Um, what? And, they don't wave back. And that, that's kind of awful yeah. of them. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's funny you mentioned uh, the whole going somewhere public and the community because right after this interview, I'm actually heading over to Bishop Ranch where, you know, you have had visited me in my office a lot of times. And remember the, the food court area that yeah. uh, we would go to? Well, they also That's have great. a little library where you can have meeting rooms and nice tables, stuff like that. And I'm meeting with, uh, you know, four of my uh, team members and we're going to have a meeting over there. Nice. And it's going to be nice to kind of get back out into where I actually used to see work. people and yeah, actually <laughs> see people smile and I'll shake a hand or two, give somebody a hug. I'm sure. Yeah. Right. right. <laughs> Definitely it is nice. Will. It is nice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just, it's, it's a, it's a, it's something different. And actually, I was, I was interviewing, I was doing some interviews uh, yesterday for some uh, new people that, that mm -hmm. may be joining uh, the team over here at Beeswax and um, chatting with them. One of them said specifically like, well, can I come into an office? Yes. Right. <laughs> yes, you can. That's a great question. Um, well, and, and so I followed it up with why. And she actually also said sense of community being around people, like getting quick answers to things like fantastic. And, you know, you, you do miss out on a lot of that stuff when you're, when you're, you know, working from home and you don't have somebody next to you. So that was one of the things that like, I guess was a, a check on the positive side for us that we have, you know, three office locations in the Bay area. Right. That was, that was a win. And it's, I guess, you know, here at this place, I know this, you know, I'm not an employee of, of the co-working space, but they've done so many things to try to make this a destination, to try to make people want to come in here, mm. right? The, I mentioned the coffee machine. It's awesome. You can make espressos and whatever, you know, you can do your, do your own thing. They have this like, you know, water, fresh water machine. They have all this like food. They do all these events like the art show to try to make this like a destination. So I thought it was good to do this particular show from here today since that's this the topic, but making your workplace a destination for people that are potential candidates. So, uh, and you know what, I, I, I talked so long, Jerry, that I'm, I'm, I think I'm going to say your last name, right? Jerry Godori. Did I, did I nail that or? Ah, oh, awesome. It. All right. Well, <laughs> welcome to the, uh, welcome to a uh, DIY for business. You're an author, you're a founder. I'd love to hear uh, a little more uh, about you. Why don't you share, uh, share who you are, what you do with our uh, audience. Awesome. Thanks very much. And thank you very much, Russ and Greg, for having me on the show. Uh, as you mentioned, my name is Jerry. I, I actually started my professional post-Marine Corps career about a long time ago. Uh, <laughs> I, I hesitate to name years, but it was pre-dot-com crash. I started off my career as a, a technical recruiter. I moved from there to sales and sales management, branch management. I ran the New England market for Kelly IT, which at the time was a $6 billion a uh, piece of business. Moved on to that to consulting. I, I owned and operated a management consulting firm where I provided um, 
assistance predominantly the technology services and product companies. Uh, everything from sales and recruiter training through go-to-market strategies and 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 good product fit counseling. But for surprisingly, one of the main things I did there was leadership counseling and manager training. Because if there's anything that technology managers and sales managers have in common, it's that they're not natural leaders. Interesting. Um, Interesting. Yeah. Why do you find that to be true? You know, I hate to generalize. I know our moms told us that that's, that's bad manners. But I think that the type of personalities that gravitate towards engineering tend not to be people people. They want to make cool stuff. They don't necessarily... Uh, want to learn how to connect it and empathize at, at a deep level with another person. Um, and the same is true, I might add, of sales folks. Sales folks tend to be very driven and tend not to be focused on external things. So those folks just naturally are not typically uh, natural leaders. I find that so, super interesting because, yeah. you know, when I think about an engineer versus a salesperson, I think the salesperson being usually should be a good communicator. And then sometimes, you know, the stereotypical engineer is a little more introverted, right? Sitting at the computer, coding, that type of thing. So when I think about just the personality types of those two roles, I think of a very opposite, but yet they still struggle with the same problem. And I, I think it's really interesting that you identified that. And do you have to work with those different roles differently so to kind of get them to be better leaders? Absolutely, yes. First of all, that was a great observation. These are very different general personalities, uh, but the thing they have in common is that the, the, their typical makeup doesn't naturally lend itself to leadership. So the ability to generalize for me ends right there. <laughs> so uh, at that point, you really have to understand the why of it. And, and when you're looking to build a team, it's important to understand, again, as a founder, any any small team leader, the leader's personality typically becomes the personality of the team. Or at the very least, it has an outsized, disproportionate impact on the personality of the team. So understanding what drives that person, what they're trying to achieve, and then working with them uh, on that and, and, how to, and how to influence the folks that they're working with to create that cohesive uh, excuse me, cohesive, highly performant team is what's key. I mean, in the book, Destination Employer, if you strip everything away, that's what it's all about. It's about how to build high performance teams. You know, um, okay, so now we're looking at, we're trying to attract different people, different things. So we've got the people that, you know, the people people and the non-people people that we're trying to pull in. How do we uh, adjust and what do we do to bring in all of those different personality types and, and to really like be a, a, a destination employer because there's so many options out there now um, that people can look at. And we see that people are flipping jobs. I think uh, you had mentioned before we even started recording, you know, within like 14 months in, in tech roles. Um, how do you attract the right people and be that destination employer when you know you've got different types of personalities that you're trying to pull in? That's a great question. So the first thing to understand is that you've got to craft your employer brand around the true culture and work environment of, of, of your establishment. So by culture, I don't mean uh, the two page list of mission and values and culture that you put on your website. I don't mean the nifty little plaque behind the founder's desk. I mean the true culture of the, of the organization and dependent on the size of your organization, the easiest way to understand that is to, is to poll your team and just ask them two simple questions. You know, when you're talking to your friends and family, what do you say about this place? How do you describe it? And listen for commonality. Everyone's gonna be a little bit different, but when you start to hear the same themes coming, you'll get an idea of what their perception of the place is. The second part, not really a question, but an observation, is getting an understanding of what they do when you're not there. I mean, truly the work culture is what the team does when the leader's not present. When you've got a good idea of what your team culture is uh, and, and you incorporate other factors like your DEI strategy and, and, and the overall theme and vibe of, of your company, you're able to establish an employer brand that makes sense for the type of people that you want to draw. The second part is understanding. So 
you mentioned astutely, you know, different types of personalities, different type of roles. Let's say for the sake of conversation organizations, and we already talked about tech and sales, we need to have a salesperson and a technology person. We want to make sure that we're seeding that employer brand in the places where those people likely are. Um, so for example, let's say that we've got five salespeople on the team. We're looking at a sixth. I might ask those five people, what, you know, what user groups do you belong to? What social media do you frequent? What associations do you belong to? What conferences do you go to? You know, what, <laughs> what podcasts and newsletters do you value? And those types of questions will let me know the higher value areas to start to create a presence. And that's the next step. Once we know where they are, we have to create a presence using our employer brand so that we can start adding value and earning the right to talk to top talent. Because one last thing to remember is that regardless of the macro environment, top talent always has choices. They always yeah. have well, you know, One of the things with that too, so I, I did just that where I asked some of my like web team, uh, you know, what websites, which websites they're visiting. Right. And of course you get the, the typical, the GitHubs and things like that. But then I go, no, no deeper, like at night, you know, when, when you, when you're done with work and you want to look at some websites, <laughs> what are you, what are you looking at? What, what are the sites that, you know, you enjoy to, to learn something new about technology or, to, you know, and I got that list and, and I used actually some of those sites as like, you know, targeting to try to find people that were similar to them. Um, so I've done that in the past I, and I think it, it works really well because you can, you know, you can do that with like Google ads or you can find those uh, different, like, you know, maybe, I don't know, I, I've, I've heard uh, people advertising on, uh, on like Reddit for positions and I've seen some positions pop up on there and those are popping up on very specific channels, you know, so I'm, I'm a big file maker nerd. So uh, the, the, the application file maker. So I see these posts pop up on occasion for, you know, file maker developers because they're trying to attract people like me. So I think a lot of people are actually are, are doing that. And I think I, I would assume that's very helpful. Um, I have and, a question, uh, I, you know, I have a question for both of you in regards to yeah. that, you know, now that, you know, many companies are, you know, hiring remote staff, and a lot of larger companies are hiring remote staff internationally, right? It's not just even in, just in the country. With that point about commonality and stuff like that, you find it even more challenging now to <laughs> find that commonality when you might be hiring an engineer in you know a different country, different continent versus America, and you know the, just you know, the way of life is just so yeah. different. Is that a big challenge for businesses now to have that commonality in, in hiring people? That's a great question. Before I answer, if I could just dial back to something Russ said real quick. So I would take the step beyond just advertising in that space. I would pick one or two of the highest value areas and start establishing a true presence. So if it's something, I'll use an easy example, like a LinkedIn user group, I'll start adding content creating relationships and, and and things like that. So they have the ability to draw the hidden talent out. Advertising is good. And if you've got the budget for it, it's great. But that's not going to draw out deep talent. The hardest thing about top talent is it doesn't need to advertise. So by creating a presence, creating value, you earn the right to engage with those types of folks. So that's the one nice. step beyond what you described that I would add. Nice. Good. Well, they, they, they find you instead of you having to go find them. I like that. Exactly. Yeah. And you know, in, in, in my old management consulting company, um, I didn't do any sales whatsoever. I spoke at conferences and owners would come up to me when I got off the stage and have a continuing conversation. And I never left a conference and had a couple of new clients. And this is a similar concept. By going out and creating a presence in those areas and adding values, uh, excuse me, adding value rather, those folks come to you and, and, and engage. And after a while, you earn that right to ask, you know, hey, Ross, I'm sure you're busy with what you're doing, but is there anybody like you you could recommend? You earn that right to, to ask that question. And that's where you get introduced to Greg, whose question mm -hmm. I'll answer. So uh, <laughs> at a macro level, yes, it's very different. Uh, the, the advent, not so much hybrid, but of the truly remote office uh, really changes things. So Redbeard is fully virtual. Um, when I was taking long-term contracting roles in larger companies, 
I typically take president, CEO, things like that. I was the president of Apicero. We had two offices in the United States and seven in India. Um, very, very different. We started off at the the uh, owner, the founder's kitchen table and ended with nine offices and a nine-figure acquisition. So it was a heck of a ride. But but when you talk about culture, um, there were micro cultures within the, within the company. So the way th that we did things in our Arizona office was wildly different than what we did in Chennai or Dubai, uh, Dubai yeah. rather. So, so uh, it, it's different. You've got to be sensitive to that. The other thing that's challenging is cultural differences. So folks in different cultures in different countries, they, there are subtle differences in communication uh, that can be problematic. Americans tend to be loud and brash. In some countries, that does not play well. Ask, ask me how I know that. Um, so, <laughs> so, so yeah, so you have to be very sensitive to that. And, and if I can further extend on the remote piece, having a remote office is also more challenging to create any type of a cohesive culture. Yeah. 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 What actually that's, that's a, I, I, Greg, I can't answer your question because I was going to ask that same question, which is, I think, why you and I are so aligned well right, together. Right. <laughs> we, we complete each other's uh, sentences or sandwiches, however you want to say it. Um, but uh, let's let's go there with the remote culture. A lot of people, you know, were shifted into this. Uh, the company that I'm at, you know, they've like done remote since the beginning. Um, so, you know, they're, they're very good at it. Um, and I think, you know, like the culture, very strong. So I came into that, you know, and I'm very lucky that I have all of that. How do you, for those companies that had to make the switch to remote in 2020 or, you know, shortly thereafter, and, and they're still in that remote culture, what did they need to do to try to create a better culture to um, just to have something like, because the old culture that they had pre 2020 is, is you know, they, it was established in the office. How do they change that so that now they can apply that in the, the remote work? You know, the pandemic did create an interesting period in every conceivable usage of that phrase. Um, and one of the things as it relates to culture and business is, is it created change that was, that was in captivity. If today, when the world is open again, any of these large companies went, we're going 100% virtual, they would lose a substantial portion of their staff. Much like the inverse now, where they're trying to get them all to RTO, return to office, and people are like, that's not what I signed up for. I'm not coming in. Because change creates that. I joined a company under a certain parameter of rules. That's no longer the case. I'm out. So, so co or the, the pandemic really, you couldn't do that. Your options weren't you know, that's where, the way it was everywhere. So so they had an advantage in that sense. So what, if it's okay with you, what I'd rather ask is how would we do that now? Because now okay. the world's open. So if a company, right. for whatever reason, wanted to go fully remote, they'd have a different thing. So, so the thing to remember about any change management effort is that individuals and groups have an appetite for change. And if you exceed that appetite, they simply don't. As you can tell by my svelte, uh, uh, svelte appearance, if you have the misfortune of seeing me live, um, I, I am not a big fan of dieting. So um, so for me to make those changes, they would have to be within what I'm willing to do. Anything outside that, I, I simply won't do. It's that way with everything. So the first thing to do if you have the time and the ability is to get a feel for, for where people stand on on working from home. Are they the type of person that needs to be in a group? You'd mentioned earlier, Russ, that the person wanted to know if they had the ability to come into an office. For some folks being trapped in their house is no bueno. That's not going to work for them. For the other, for others, that's a huge advantage. You know, so again, you want to get a feel for where they stand. Um, those that are aligned with it are the safer ones. Those that aren't, you you have to understand at that point that there's a substantial chance you'll lose them. So, so you've got to keep that in mind when you're making that change. And then you have to weigh the potential loss with the gain of whatever reason you're going remote. When it comes to building culture in a remote team, it's really not dissimilar to doing it in person. Uh, just really the, the, the only big difference is, is, is that you have to do it more conscientiously. You have to think to reach out to your remote employee. 
your remote employee, as, as much as it might not be popular, has to take the responsibility for being in a low visibility role. And they need to make the conscious effort to, to create and build that relationship. You know, something I've never thought of before until we had this conversation. So I'm really excited that we're having this <laughs> is I'm wondering because in, in Russ's case, you know, he has a, you know, he's with a company that has locations that you can go to. And there's a lot of people that are working remotely. And I just, the thought just came into my mind is, are there certain departments that benefit by being in a, a physical location working mm -hmm. together? versus other departments where it really doesn't matter you know as long as it's managed well you can be anywhere in the world um have you guys ever thought of that and you, you know is that a good strategy yeah absolutely yes i will say this right now i have personally trained hundreds if not thousands of recruiters and salespeople over the years i've trained technical people in how to be consultants they went from inside roles to outside roles um and i will say this there is no amount of money that you could pay me to try to train somebody from zero fully remote in, in any of the three skills that I just talked about, because there's an enormous value in the osmosis learning that occurs from watching and listening to more senior personnel go throughout their day. So there are certain things that are just very difficult to do remotely. I'm not going to say impossible, but very difficult. Um, they are fewer than died in the wool return to office purists would probably lead you to believe, but there are certainly roles that, that play better. And you also bring up another super important thing, Greg, I should have mentioned when I was talking about culture. A company has a culture, but individual teams have their own culture too. Um, if you've been a part of a big company, if you walk into the accounting offices, it's going to be probably a pretty different experience than if you crawl under the stairs where the Unix guys hang out with their servers. Um, so different teams have different cultures. Yeah, makes mm -hmm. sense. Yeah, totally. Uh, one other thing, because uh, I know we're, we're we're getting towards the end here. Uh, so I, I I wrote this down when we were talk, talking uh, before we started recording. Was the you, you said building retention? but doing that from the start. Can you, can you talk a little about that? Absolutely, yes. So I've been doing this for a long time. When I first started out recruiting, uh, people stayed at a job typically five plus years. As a matter of fact, if you were in a job for less than five years without a compelling reason why, you were labeled a job hopper. Then it went from that to the expectation was no more than two jobs in five years. And now for salespeople, the average is uh, 11 months in a role. And for technical people, it's 14 on average. So that's obviously problematic, especially, again, I keep using salespeople and technical people as examples, but with salespeople, the average salesperson isn't profitable for a company until about 16 months. So if they're staying for two thirds of that period of time, that, that's that's a, a, a hard road to hoe. So the mm -hmm. way that you combat that is all about what I talked about when we're creating employer brand and then moving that into recruiting. So the, the book that I wrote, Destination Employer, is all about how to become a destination employer. The way I define that as is a high prestige place that 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 candidates understand that they can 10x career their, their career in. And we break the process into three phases, attract, recruit, and retain. I've kind of talked about attraction. Um, and retention starts with attraction in that employer brand I described. But it gets deeper in recruitment. So now that we've got that candidate's attention and we're starting to reach out and engage with them, we need to lead with what's of interest to them. We need to understand before we even get to the need of qualifying that candidate's skills and experience, what they're trying to achieve in their career, what they're trying to do in their next role, what they like about our role once we get into that, what they don't like about our role. Make the assumption for brevity, uh, which it should be clear I'm not great at, but make the assumption for brevity um, that we do extend an offer, they, they take it and everything is good. Everything that recruiter learned about their career path aspirations, uh, what they like and don't like needs to be downloaded to their their manager, become a part of the orientation, become a part of the initial intake meeting with their new manager, and needs to become a part of their career development throughout the, their time with the organization. And the more effectively that you do that, 
the more you send the clear message to your new hire that you care about their development. And I'll end my monologue. I apologize with this one last thought. So in my experience working with dozens and dozens of companies, employees stay with a team until one of three things breaks. I call it the EFG model. E is engagement. An employee feels heard and their opinion value. Not necessarily always followed, but heard and value. F, fulfillment. They feel good about their job or they feel good about the mission their company is accomplishing. And then G is growth. Their skills are, and responsibilities are increasing. And ideally, when they hit the cap in their job, there's further growth in the company. If those three things are in place, they're engaged, they're fulfilled, and they're growing, they're not going anywhere. There's no reason for them to. But the second that's not the case, they're polishing really? their resume. They're, 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 they're looking. They're looking. Yeah. You know, I, 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 is that what you're uh, building into the new program that you're putting together? Exactly correct. You know, there are so many key things that are not especially difficult, but that need to be in place from the word go. It's it's a, a pretty straightforward methodology, a pretty straightforward process. When you get them in place, it's easier for you to track candidates. It's easier for you to get them to join the company and they stay longer. And when they leave, they're still an asset. So one of the things that I talk about a lot uh, for people who follow me on LinkedIn or or take my content is, is the concept of a whole life cycle. Heck, you're both business people. You've had you've had clients and customers that go and come back. The concept is the same with employees. You know, if somebody leaves, they don't need to be a mortal enemy of the company. They can still be a source of referrals. They might come back on their own. You know, so by creating alumni groups and that concept, you really open that door wide. And we cover all that in, in, in our in our model. Nice. Nice. Um, but before I ask where we can get more information about that, I'm going to ask a follow-up question here on, on, on that portion of it, specifically the downloading of the information, right? Like you, you said, you, you collect all this information during the recruitment process. Well, you don't want that just to go away because you've learned all of this about this person. Um, what about databasing all of that as well? Instead, you know, and, and making sure that that, like, I, I feel like so many people don't think about, well, you know what, for a client, I'm going to database all this information and store, you know, in my CRM, all of this information about the client. But I don't know if as many people think about that, about their employees, that the hires that they're they're bringing on. And when you get, you know, okay, well, you, you've got two people working for you. It's pretty easy to, to get to know them. But when you've got, you know, you've got 100, you've got 50 even, you know, like, how do you know all of that information? Or you've got people coming and going. Like, I think I just want to, I guess I'm just being an advocate here for making sure that all of that information is databased and um, uh, making sure that, you know, that is being tracked throughout their relationship with you before, during, and after the them being a part of your team. If I could piggyback on that observation, um, that's key in being a leader. If you are effective at making sure people understand you legitimately cons are concerned with their development, they're far more likely to stay with you and deal with your occasional slip-ups because there's value there. You've To steal from Dr. Stephen Covey, you've made deposits in the emotional uh, piggy bank. So, mm -hmm. so, so you can draw from that. So I couldn't agree more. In my methodology, uh, we, we embed that in their, in their employee review process and review it throughout that cycle. And we also add it to their career planning. Um, so again, I, I couldn't agree with you more. The more that we look at our team as internal clients, the more our mindset is right. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah. Yep. So yeah. if people want to reach out to you and, and learn more about how you might be able to help them either directly or through Redbeard, what's the best way for them to reach out to you? Um, if you can't find me, you're not looking. I'm the easiest guy in the world to find. Uh, I, I, I pretty much live on LinkedIn. It's the biggest business uh, social networking site in the world, so I'm there all the time. Uh, you can reach out to me through my site in uh, Redbeard, as we mentioned, redbeardsol.com. Uh, or you can reach out to me uh, via Amazon by buying my book. What's the name of the book again, please? Uh, uh, let's Destination Employer, uh, How to Consistently Attract, Recruit, and Retain Top Talent. But all joking aside, first of all, you both have been great. I deeply appreciate the opportunity to be on your show. And I'd love to do it again. 
Um, but easiest way to get me is LinkedIn. If you connect with me on LinkedIn or DM me on LinkedIn, I will always accept. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I feel like we did just, you know, hit the top of the iceberg there and there's so much below the water that we need to touch on. So we, we probably should have you back again and uh, chat more at, at some point here. So thank you for joining us today. And for those listening, thank you for listening, subscribing and reviewing DIY for business. Uh, it, we've, you know, we, we've actually hit over a hundred uh, episodes and we didn't even wow. mention that. We didn't even celebrate that during our hundredth episode. So uh, we, we do we, that. We, we did it off you know, camera actually, but yeah, we, we did. should do we it on camera. Yeah, yeah, there you go. I just exactly. heard there the same bottle, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, all the all of the information provided uh, is opinion based. You might want to consult a professional to discuss your exact business situation. Greg and I want your company to succeed, and we are happy to take your questions. We'd love to hear your feedback on the show. We'd love to also hear your ideas for future episodes. So if there's a solid air like a business or like area that you need some solid business advice, let us know. Just go to our website, DIYforbusiness.com, fill out the form. And we've built shows around ideas that have come in and uh, guests that have come in. We've had a few business owners on the show um, to just chat about their business. And, and we learn from them and, and hear about their experiences. We love to do that. So please, I do encourage you to go to DIYforbusinesspodcast.com. The link is in the podcast description. We thank you again for listening and subscribing to DIY for Business, where you are not alone. 